Well, good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It's good to be together. It's good to be in the house to celebrate the, the resurrection. I was going to say the birth of Jesus. It's not Christmas yet. <laughs> That's not Russian. <laughs> but to celebrate the resurrection of our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. And how many know, you know we celebrate it on this Sunday, but how many know we get to celebrate it every day? Every day he's alive. Every day we celebrate that resurrection, that that coming out of the grave. And how many know, if he came out of the grave, you can come out of the grave too. Jesus said, you know, uh, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Come on. If he's overcome, you can overcome too. Here's the thing you have to understand. See, there's so many Christians are trying to fight for victory. They're always trying to get victory or fight for victory. With With the victory of Jesus and where he's seated and where you're seated in heavenly places with him, we start from victory. And we fight from victory. We don't fight for victory. We already have the victory. Why? Because he has the victory. And if he has the victory, you have the victory. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So, um... So, I don't know, it, it, there's a lot going on. You know, I just read an article. Uh, we need to pray for our nation. I mean, we, we really do. I just read an article yesterday, actually, where um, our president basically made today, and he, and he made a declaration from the Oval Office, making today um, a day of visibility for transgendered people. Of all days. It's a mockery of God. It's a mockery of our Lord and Savior to make this day. You know, I understand people want their days, whatever. They can have their days. But to make this day, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, a day of visibility for transgendered people is a mockery to God. And so, you know, he, he made this big statement by the authority that was invested in him. He, in him. he made this day a national day of visibility for these people. So you know what? Yeah, by the authority that's been invested in me by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the authority of Jesus Christ, I declare that this day is all about Jesus and none other. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, that's, that's what it's about. It's not about anything else. It's about him. It's not about a bunny. It's not about eggs. It's about Jesus. It's all about him. It's about him being uh, crucified for us, but being resurrected for us so that we can have newness of life. That's what it's about. And so we need to get back. The church needs to get back to being on their knees and praying for our nation, praying for our leaders because they're blinded. We have people that are in our Oval Office. We have people that are in the halls of Congress, the halls of Senate, Senate, that I I truly believe that are possessed of devils. And they're running this this country like a bunch of devils. Amen. But how many know, as righteous sons of God and righteous people, when we see injustice or we see unrighteousness, we bring justice and righteousness to it. We make decrees and declare things and commands. Why? I just did it. By the power invested in me, we make this day about Jesus. Why? Because we're righteous sons and we make those righteous decrees just as our Heavenly Father would do that same thing. Amen? Amen. So, just wanted to get that out there this morning. But uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, go with me. Um, go with me. Let's start in Galatians chapter two, verse twenty. Got a bunch of scriptures. We'll see how many we get through this morning. Uh, I would enti- I'd, I'd, I'd title this message, this teaching, uh, what I would give it a title. I would title it the likeness. Uh, yeah, the likeness of His resurrection. Because how many know uh, we are to be in the likeness of His resurrection. We're also to be in the likeness of His death, but we're to be in the likeness of His resurrection. See. You got to understand something. Sowing and reaping was a law that was established in the earth. It's it's not even technically a kingdom law, which it does it does work that law, those systems, and within a kingdom there are laws and systems. You know, within the, uh, the kingdom of the United States or our government, there's laws and systems that have been put in place. Some good, some really crooked and messed up, but there's still laws and systems. Within God's kingdom, there are laws and systems, things that we must be obedient to. Amen. Uh, and so now within that, I would say that. Is, is the law of sowing and reaping. But technically, it's not even a law of the kingdom. It goes into the kingdom, and it works in the kingdom. But the law of sowing and reaping has been something that has been established from the very beginning of the earth. Actually, in Genesis, uh, I think it's actually in Genesis chapter maybe 8. I have to go back and look, but I think it's around there. Around there. It says that um, as, as long as the earth remains, which I checked this morning, and it's still here. Did you see it? Okay. It's here. As long as the earth remains... 
Seed time and harvest time shall remain. Now, he lists a bunch of different things, night and day and cold and summer or winter and summer and all those things, but seed time and harvest. Now, any good farmer, especially this time of year, the, the farmers are starting to get ready. I started to notice some of the Amish farms are starting to till the dirt and getting them worked up, and you're going to start seeing some of the commercial farmers doing that as well. They're, they're, they do it with excitement. Why? Because they know, you know it's a lot of work. But it's what that work, that time invested, is going to reproduce or, or produce a harvest come the fall, come the autumn. Why? Because the seeds that they sow today will bring an increase months later, right? And so seed time and harvest. Now, Galatians actually says, which I had you turn to Galatians, but I think it's in Galatians chapter 4. It actually says that God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he, sows, if he sows unto death, if he sows unto sin, he'll guess what? Of, of sin or of death, he'll reap destruction. But if he sows of the Spirit, of the Spirit will he reap life, right? And so every, in, in everything, whether it's physical things, spiritual things, whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. Now, see, it's interesting because God put this in his word so he knows it. And he, here's the thing about God. The laws and systems that he establishes, even himself he abides by. He will not abide by a law or a system that, well, let me put it this way. He will not require you to abide by a law or a system that he established that he himself is not willing to abide by himself. So God understands the law of sowing and reaping. And so we have to understand about his son Jesus. Remember, uh, I believe it's in John chapter 8, uh, there's a bunch of Greeks that come to see Jesus. Jesus is in Jerusalem. It's a, uh, it's a feast time. Uh, a lot of times during feast times, you know, they would travel back and forth to Jerusalem. Jesus is in Jerusalem. And, and a lot of people would come to Jerusalem during feast times. And so there's a bunch of Greeks that show up, and they come to the disciples of Jesus, and they say to Jesus' disciples, we want to see Jesus. And so Jesus' disciples find John, and, and well, you know, Jesus' inner circles was pretty much Peter, James, and John. And so he finds them guys, and he says, hey, where's, where's Jesus at? And they go to Jesus, and they, you know, and they say, Jesus, there's a, there's a bunch of Greeks here to see you. And Jesus' response to his disciples was this, unless a grain of wheat dies and falls into the ground, it'll never reproduce itself. Now, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. You're there just informing Jesus that someone's here to see him. And he responds that way. You're probably going to go, what are you talking about, Jesus? Stop talking in riddles. There's some Greeks here to see you. He says, no, no, you don't understand. Unless a grain of wheat dies and falls into the ground, it'll never reproduce itself. See, that's the beauty of death. Death, by, by something dying and it going into the ground, it'll reproduce itself. What Jesus was saying to his disciples, he says, listen, there's going to come a time or a day where I won't be here. And when the Greeks want to come see Jesus, they're not going to have to, they're not going to see me because I'm going to be with my father. They're going to have to look at you. Why? Because unless I die and go into the ground, I'll never be able to reproduce myself and all of you. Right? And so now watch this. If God, so I'm building on to something because I wanted you guys to see this this morning. If God, right, has established sowing and reaping, would he not understand the power of sowing his son into the ground to get more sons that look just like Jesus? Okay. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to get your cranks thinking this morning. I'm going to get your cranks turning this morning, right? Think about this. If I went to the store... And I bought, a, let's say, a bag of apple seeds, okay? And I take them home, and I plant the apple seeds into the ground. What am I to expect a harvest of? If I get oranges, was that a good seed? No. It was probably mislabeled, right? Or let me ask you this. What farmer is going to put a... Um, they're going to buy a good seed, a good quality seed. They're not going to buy, you know, a poor quality seed. They're going to buy a good seed because if they know if they plant a good seed into good, well-prepared soil, they're going to reproduce that seed. And it's going to come back, and it's going to be the same of the same quality uh, uh, of, the, of the seed that was planted, right? God did not plant his son into the ground to reproduce some mutant, mediocre, you know, half, you know, looking like Jesus kind of Christian. He put his son, and how many know his son was good seed? Come on. He put his son into the ground fully expecting to reproduce within you sons that look just like Jesus. 
People say, oh, we could never look like Jesus. Well, the Bible actually says opposite, and we're going to look at that this morning. The Bible actually says that you should look just like him. And we're going to look at some verses this morning. So hopefully by now you found Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I want to start there. So let's look what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. He says, starting in verse 20, he says, I, everybody say I. I I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now watch this. You've been what with him? See, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. See, that was his declaration, but that should be your declaration every day. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. See, the problem with Christianity today is we have Christians that are running around living all for themselves. It's about me, me, me. What can I get out of this? Uh, how can I get blessed? And, and everything's about them. I mean, even, even the services, even the churches, I mean, everything has to be about them. But Paul said, said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So let me ask you something. When's the last time you went to a funeral and you said bad things about the person in the casket and they got out of the casket to defend themselves? Why? Because dead men don't have feelings. Dead men don't care what other people say about them. They're not worried about their needs. Why? Because they're dead. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Now watch what he says here. He says, it is no longer I who... See, this is the, one of the main scriptures that is no longer preached within churches anymore because everybody wants to be about themselves. Well, I got my feelings. Well, you know, well you, you're hurting my feelings by saying that. Well, see, there it is. You, it should be you that no longer lives, right? And so if I poke you or prod you and I get a response out of you, I'm realizing out of you, you're not dead yet. See, I heard a preacher preach one time. He says, oh, he says, we must live buttonless. Get rid of your buttons. You know, why? Because the enemy is going to come along and try to push your buttons. And if he push, watch, if he finds the right button that he can push and he can get a response out of you, guess what he's going to do all the time? Push that button. But if he comes to you and he finds that no matter what button he pushes, he gets Jesus, guess what he's going to stop doing? Pushing buttons. See, we should ooze Jesus, that when pressures of life come, that when people attack us, when they persecute us, when they say evil things against us, they shouldn't hear you. They should hear Jesus. They should, they should see Jesus. They should experience Jesus. And so every time the enemy comes and squeezes you, if he gets anything else other than Jesus, he's going to continue to squeeze you. But if every time he squeezes you or touches you or pushes you or whatever it is, he, and he gets Jesus' flashback on him, he's going to stop pushing those buttons. So he must live buttonless. What does that look like? That looks like it's no longer you who lives. I don't have any buttons. Push away. Because there's nothing there. Right? And so, why? So Because we, it's no longer I who live. But watch this. But Christ lives in me. Where does he live now? In, in you. Why? Because Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says, Christ in you the hope of glory. That's what Paul said. He says this is the mystery that's been hidden from the foundations of the world that Christ would actually come and dwell in each and every one of you. That it would be Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not that it would be Christ in you that you're going to get the glory, but that it's glory's hope that Christ would be manifested in each and every one of you. That when the world would look at you, they would no longer see Jim. They would no longer see Randy. They would no longer see Katie. They would see Jesus. Because it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now watch what he says. He goes on. He says, and the life which I now live in the flesh. So watch what Paul's doing. He's, a, he's, not, he's not saying, listen, it's not that I'm physically dead. Because I'm, I'm still in the flesh. But the life that I now live in the flesh, the life that I, because I'm living, I'm breathing, I can feel, I can taste, I can see, I can touch, I can smell, right? I can do all those things, but the life that I now do live in the flesh, I live by faith. Why? Because the just walk by faith, not by sight. See, what does that mean? That means I've crucified, cru crucified, I've crucified my senses. I've crucified my feelings. I've crucified my emotions. Now, understand, you still have emotions. There's still times we feel happy and sad. And, but watch, you can, now that your emotions have been glorified and sanctified, you can now use your emotions for God's glory. That's why the Bible says be angry and 
Why? Because there's an anger that God has called a righteous indignation. Just like yesterday when I read that article about our so-called president in the White House making this so-called declaration, there was a righteous indignation that rose up within me, and I got angry. But I didn't sin. People say, oh, God's always in a good mood. Says who? See, I used to be in a church that would say that all the time. God's always in a good mood. Says who? Because I tell you what, Genesis chapter 126 says I'm created in his image and his likeness. And if there's times that I feel anger, guess what? There's times that God feels anger. If there's times where I feel saddened, there's times. Now, see, our feelings are on a finite level. His are infinite. So if, I'm, if me on a finite level am feeling that anger towards that unrighteous thing that happened yesterday, what do you think God feels on an infinite level? Right? And so I'm not saying be dead to your feelings. I mean, you can be dead to your feelings in the sense of sensual, demonic thinking, like, the, like using your feelings like, okay, don't live on your feelings. There was a song, you know, Hooked on a Feeling, Right? That's what the church is. The church is always hooked on feelings. Well, we've got to feel this. We've got to feel the presence of God. We've got we to gotta feel saved. We've got to feel joyful. We gotta, no, 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 no. You, just, you don't need to feel anything. Now, the feelings will be there, but don't live by them. Don't be ruled by them. Why? Because feelings will lie to you all the time. If you trust your feelings, you will be misled all the time. Because the just don't walk by feelings. They walk by what? faith. And so the life that I now live, I live by faith, he says here, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, go to Romans chapter 6. Turn to Romans chapter 6 real quick. Romans chapter 6 and go to the first verse. Romans chapter 6, starting the first verse. It says here, now, understanding we've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. No. So if I'm dead, I should also be dead to what? Sin. Sin should have no rule over me, no reign over me. Do you realize, church, that the power of sin was dealt with through the cross, the burial, and the resurrection? It was dealt with. Why? He that knew no sin, what? Became sin. So when he hung on that cross, when he was beaten, he became every curse. He became sin for you and I. Why? He became what we were so we could become as he is. See, we've got we to remember this in the likeness of his resurrection this morning. Now, starting to first, verse 1, Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Or some translations say, God forbid that we do that. But yet there's a group of people out there that actually teach on a sloppy grace. That it don't matter what you do, it's all under God's grace. And they treat grace like a credit card. But yet Paul says here, should we just continue to sin because grace is abounding there? No, absolutely not. Certainly not. God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Why? Because remember Galatians 2.20, it ain't no longer you who lives. Why? Because if you are still living in sin and practicing sin, it proves that you're not dead. Because if you were dead, you'd be dead to that sin. You'd be dead to that thing, right? And so he goes on. He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know, verse 3, that as many of us as, are, as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now, let's follow along. I'm building, I'm building to show you something here real quick. Gosh. Galatians chapter 2.20 says you are what? Crucified with Christ. Now, here in Romans chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 3, he says that you have been buried with Christ. Now, how was the burial? The burial was through what? Baptism. See, baptism is one of the most beautiful things. And uh, if, if anybody in here wants to be baptized, never been baptized, we'll get you baptized. We, we need to do some baptism soon because baptisms are so important. You know, it's, it's, uh, um, now, you don't need to be baptized to be saved, You're, or you should be baptized, but you don't need it, because if that's the case, that would signify that uh, the baptism or the water was stronger than the blood of Jesus, and that's not true. The blood of Jesus was enough. But we should, out of obedience, want to follow him in water baptism, signifying our death, burial, and resurrection. Why? Because just as he was crucified, I was crucified with him. When he hung on that cross 2,000 years ago, guess what? You hung there with him. 
And when he was put into that grave and the stone was rolled over that tomb, guess what? You were put in that grave and the stone was rolled over your tomb. But how many of you know, when that tomb, when that stone was rolled away and he came out of that tomb victoriously, you came out with him. See, water baptism is beautiful. Why? Because it signifies that death and that burial. Going down into the water, putting you down into the grave, putting you down into the tomb, gone. Old man, dead. Now watch. Then you come out of the water, right? And what's the first thing? Once you're under the water, what's the first thing that happens when you come up out of the water? The water what? Breaks. What's the first thing that happens at childbirth? The water breaks. See, it's signifying that newness of life. Because watch what Paul says here. He goes on. He says, don't you realize or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, verse 4. See, now we know what it's there for, so we didn't start there. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Right there it is. It's scriptural. You were crucified with him. You were buried with him, right? That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Hmm. So watch that. Now, I'm going to read that one more time because I got that in bold in my, my paper here. It says, now watch this, even so we should walk in newness of life. Just as he, let me tell you something, the same Jesus that went into the grave wasn't the same Jesus that came out of the grave. He didn't come out a defeated Jesus. He didn't come out with sin still on him. He didn't come out with sickness striped across his back. He didn't come out looking the same anymore. He came out of that grave victorious. And when he, he came out of that grave, you came out of that grave with him victorious. He didn't come out the same. Now watch. He says, now we should, he came out, he came out of that grave with newness of life. Right? And so even we should walk in that newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly. Now, how many know when you see the word certain, it's a certain thing? It's like a contract. It's, 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 I mean, if you ever read some of the contracts and some of the things that lawyers draw up and they use these old Elizabethan English words because a lot of our court systems and legal systems use things like this. And so when you see something on a contract that is certain, guess what? You don't have to question it, do you? This is certain, meaning this is going to happen. This shall happen. This is, this, is, this is not even questionable, right? So it says here, if you've been united together, everybody say united together. See, that's the problem with a lot of churches in Christianity today is the church, or most, from most pulpits, most pulpits are trying to divide you in Christ. They're trying to show you, well, you're not just like Jesus. You know, sit down there. You don't get, you know, you're just a little excited there. You know, simmer down there a little, you know. I don't know what you want to call you, but simmer down there, buttercup. You know, <laughs> that wasn't the word I was looking for, but that's what wanted to come out of my mouth. <laughs> right? And so simmer down there. You know, you're just getting a little excited, you know. No, no, no. no see, I, I, I've been born again. I've got newness of life. I have victory. I'm united with him. And see, yet the church is trying to divide you for the most part. But the Bible says what God has joined together, let no man separate. See, we always quote that at marriages and at weddings. But he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about you being joined together with Christ. That he, being the bridegroom, you, the church, being the bride, would come together just as a man and a woman come together to consummate their marriage. And the Bible says that the two shall become one flesh. See, it's the, it's the thing that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter uh, 5, or it's actually 6, when he talks about marriages, and he says that this is a great mystery to me. He says this whole thing with a man, a woman leaving her, her parents and joining to her husband and the two becoming one flesh. He says, but I don't talk about marriages. I'm not using this example to show you marriages. I'm using this example to show the church and Jesus Christ that the two should come together and be one. That what God had joined together, let no man separate. So if you're sitting in a church that's trying to separate you and God or you and Jesus, and trying to, well, you're not like Jesus. Just sit over there. Jesus is over here. You're over there. No, no, no. It says it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. I have him. So I don't know where you're looking. He's right here. 
So he says, watch. He says, for we, watch, we've been, oh, I'll be back up here. We've been buried with him. We should walk with newness of life. For Verse 5, for if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also, or all, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. See, this is, what I, this is where I want to just, this is what I was building to, showing you right here in Scripture, being in the likeness of, of his resurrection, that when he came out of that grave, you came out with him too, and that whatever he came out with and whatever Jesus now has, you have. Why? Because the Bible says that your joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ. A joint heir, a co-heir, what do they do? They share in everything. So whatever Christ has, I have. Whatever he is, I am. He was like, well, that's blasphemy. You're saying I am? Absolutely. He said, watch. Well, actually, I want to show you this real quick. Go with me. It's not on, well, it's in your Bibles, yeah. It's, it is in your Bibles. It's not on my paper. I was going to say, it's not in your Bibles. What, no, it's in your Bibles. It's not on my paper. Go with me to John chapter 1 real quick. I want you to see this. John chapter 1, starting in the 12th verse. People say, see, this was the thing that Jesus got reviled for. They called him a son of the devil. They called him a, a, a worker of miracles by the power of Beelzebub, that he would, he would cast out demons by demons, and that the things that he spoke were false. They, they labeled him a false prophet. Why? Because he stood up and he says, God is my father and I am his son. And the, and the Pharisees, which were the religious people, hated him for it. See, You've got to understand something, church. The Pharisees, which were the religious people of the day, didn't want to crucify Jesus for the miracles. They didn't want to crucify him for the healings. They didn't want to crucify him for feeding people and clothing people and helping. That's not why he wanted, they wanted to crucify him. You know why they wanted to crucify him? Because of his teaching. Because of what he said out of his mouth. He says, I am the Son of God. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they ripped their clothes and they got angry. Why? Because they thought, you're blaspheming. How can you say you're a son of God? Are you greater than Abraham? Well, what did he say? He says, before Abraham was, I am. Right? Now watch what John chapter 1 says. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's what he labeled himself. But he, said, he writes this. He says, but as many, starting in 12th verse, if I didn't tell you the verse, 12th verse, but as many as received him. Say received him. Receive. That word received doesn't mean you just receive him like a gift. Now it does. There, there's, a, there's a connotation to understanding you've received him, but it would better be translated in the Greek, it would actually better be translated that as many as appropriated him. See, you can receive a sweater but until you put the sweater on, you ain't appropriated it. Are you getting me? Just because you received a gift doesn't mean you've actually received it and appropriated it and made it yours. Some of y'all got gifts that were given to you sitting in your closet that you're just waiting to re-gift to somebody else. Don't, don't, don't look down right now. You, I know there's some of you out there that got some gifts in your closet. Be like, well, that's nice. Give that to somebody else one day. Right? See, you never appropriated it. You received the gift, but you never appropriated it. You never made it yours. You never used it. You never put it on. You never wore it. So he says, but for as many as appropriated him, received him, put him on, he says to them, he gave the power or the right or the authority to become the children of God, the sons of God. So just as Jesus was a son, guess what you are now? Why? Because he's a joint heir. And whatever Jesus is and whatever Jesus has, I share in. So just watch this. Just watch. If I've received him, he's given to me the right, the authority, the power, the ability to stand and declare to you this morning that I am a son of God. And the very thing that the Pharisees rent their clothes, I get to say the same thing. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because I'm his son and he's my dad. Right? And he says, now watch, he's given you the, the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. So, 
just as he came out of that grave, being the likeness of his resurrection, we should be the same. We should be the same. Verse 6 in Romans. Go back to Romans chapter 6. I'm sorry. So flip back to Romans. We're not done in Romans yet. We're almost done. We're not done yet, quite yet. Go back to Romans chapter 6, verse 6. So just as we were in the likeness, we should be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, verse 6, that our old man was crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, so if what we're declaring this morning is true, which it is because it's in the word of God and it's truth. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Why? Because if he died, I died. And if he's alive, guess what I am? I'm alive. And so we shall also be alive with him or live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now let me tell you something right now, church. If death no longer has dominion over Jesus, guess what? Death no longer has dominion over you. What did Paul say? Oh, death, where is thou sting? Where is your sting? It's gone. It's been removed. Death is not something to be feared anymore. Even though, watch, even though every one of us physically will experience a passing or a death of the flesh, how many know? Just because, you know, one day this flesh, you know, Pastor Shane's flesh is going to give up and it's going to go down, it's going to lay down, and, but how many know Pastor Shane's not going to stop living? It's the same for you. You know, Jim, one day Jim's going to, you know, pass away, but you know, Jim's not going to stop living. Just the flesh of Jim's going to stop living. So death has no longer any sting. There's no longer any fear. Why? To, because to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. So there's nothing to fear anymore. There's no separation in death. There's no fear in death. And so he says, now if death has no dominion over him, it shouldn't have any dominion over us. Verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives for God. Or he lives to God. Watch this. Verse 11, what does it start off with? Likewise. Why? Because we should be in the likeness of his resurrection. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, go with me to Romans chapter 8. So flip over a couple pages. Romans chapter 8 and go to the 29th verse. Romans chapter 8, starting in the 29th verse. It says this, For whom... He foreknew. Now, I want to stop there. He foreknew you. He knew you. Go back and read. Uh, I'm going to take a note, jot this down, look at it later this week or whatever. Go back and read Psalm 139. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you. He, he foreknew you. He, even before, watch this, even before the foundations of the world were laid, he knew you. He knew, the, he knew the very hour that you would be upon the earth, the very year, the very moment. He knew that for such a time as this, you would be placed here to do a work of the ministry, to, to, to do, do the work of the kingdom, to expand the kingdom, to increase the kingdom, to bring glory and honor to his name. He knew you. He formed you. He fashioned you. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, plans of pro to prosper you. Uh, and I love how the King James actually ends that. It says, plans to bring you to an expected end. So he knew you. And he foreknew you, right? And so he, to, so watch this. For whom he foreknew, which everybody say, that's me. That's you. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, stop there. Because there's, you know, a lot of talk about predestination. Especially in a, different, a lot of different denominations or, you know, especially Calvin, especially from a Calvinist side of that. They always talk about predestination. That we're all predestined and then all of us are either predestined to heaven or hell or... No, no, no. See, we'll talk about predestination this morning, but we're going to talk about it from a biblical standpoint. Because here it says, you were predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. There's your predestination. You were predestined. Your destiny before the foundation of the earth was even set. Your destiny was to look like Jesus. 
God, God's plan for you, His expected end for you in Jeremiah 29 and 11, was to bring you to that expected end, which that expected end is that you would come out of that grave with Jesus and look just like Him. That's His plan for you. So He's predestined you, watch this church, to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, stop there. Romans, uh, let me think about this now, yeah. Yeah, Romans chapter 10. Well, hold on, let me just look it up real quick. No, it's not Romans chapter 10, it's Romans chapter 12. Sorry, I'm thinking. Yeah. I will misquote it, so I'll just look it up. <clears throat> yeah, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 in the second verse says this. And do not be conformed to this world. Okay, so you see the same words? Here he says in Romans chapter 8, he says that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of a son. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, and do not be conformed to this world. Now that word conformed, why do, why do I want to show you this? Because that word conformed in the Greek gives the idea or the picture of something being taken and pressed and molded and put into a form or a fashion. So he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, do not be conformed, pressed, molded into the image or into the world. Why? Because the world wants you to look a certain way. The world wants you to talk a certain way. They want you to be like them. And he says, don't be like the world. Don't be fashioned like them. Don't look like them. Don't talk like them. Don't smell like them. Don't, don't even look like them at all. He says, so don't be conformed to the world. But watch what Romans chapter 12 actually finishes saying. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, is where we get our uh, English word metamorphis, where it, like a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and he metamorphoses into a beautiful butterfly. And so he says, don't be conformed, pressed, molded into the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now watch, how do you renew your mind? You renew your mind according to the word of God. Now watch what he says here. Go back to Romans chapter 8 in verse 29. He says that you have been predestined to be conformed. Why? Because, watch, he is the potter, you are the clay. God, before he even knew you in your mother, well, before he formed you in your mother's womb, had already formed and fashioned you and predestined you to look just like his son Jesus. That was his plan from the very beginning. From the very beginning to the very end, God knew that he would form and fashion you and his predestined for you was to look like Jesus. Now watch. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he, who? Jesus. Right? He's talking about you, but now he's talking about Jesus. That he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now watch. He was the firstborn. Why? Because he was the first one to come out of that grave, but you followed right after him. He was the firstborn son, firstborn again son. Why? Because he became sin, he became sickness, he became disease. The Bible says that everyone that hangs on a tree is cursed, so therefore Jesus became a curse for you so that you could become a blessing. There's no, lo there's no longer such a thing as a generational curse anymore. If it's a generational curse, it's because of choices that you have made or someone else has made, but it ain't, it ain't something that you know, God has placed on you. He became a curse. So therefore, I'm not, I'm not cursed. Now, when Jesus came out of that grave, guess what? Born again as a brand new son. Watch, he no longer had sin on him. He no longer had curse on him. He no longer had diseases on him. He came out victoriously, the firstborn among many born-again brethren. And now, watch, Mary appears to him in the garden. And he, you know, she supposes that he's the gardener <clears throat> until she hears his voice. Excuse me. And she falls at his feet and falls at his, on her knees and says, Rabboni. And he says, don't cling to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father. Right? In other words, he, I've not yet taken the blood to sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. But he says, watch what he says. He says, but go tell my brothers and my sisters that I'm alive. My brethren. Go tell my brethren. What does that mean? Brethren is siblings. See, before that, he couldn't call them brothers. He couldn't call them siblings. He would call them friends. It was a time in the, uh, in the upper room where Jesus is eating with them and dining and washing their feet. And he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Why? Because a servant doesn't know what the master's doing, but a friend knows what a friend's doing at all times. 
He yet couldn't call them sons or brothers yet. He, he, saw, he wanted to call them brothers, but it wasn't until he came out of that grave that he could say, go tell my brothers that I'm alive. Why? Because now they're brothers. Now watch. So this is why he was, this is why, this is your predestination to be conformed into his image. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. See, that likeness and that image was lost in the garden, but in this garden, it was restored to mankind. It was given back to us. We could again be in the likeness and image of God's Son. Moreover, verse 30, Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. So if you're predestined to look like Jesus, guess what? You're called. You're called to the ministry. You're called to do kingdom work. You're called to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You're called. He was like, well, I just don't know my calling. No, nope, it's right here. It's, this is it. You're called to look like him. And so if he's predestined you, he's also called you. To whom he called, these he also justified. What does that mean? He's made you right. By the blood of Jesus, you've been justified, you've been made right. You have, you have just as much right to stand before the, before the throne of God as Jesus does. You have ju- I'll even go further. You have just as much right to be seated on the throne with Jesus at the right hand of the Father as Jesus does. That's the idea of justification and righteousness. That's the position that you as a son have been put in. Now, you didn't do anything to deserve it, but everything he did got you there. You know what that's called? Grace, unmerited favor. I didn't do anything to earn it, but God, in His love and in His mercy and in His kindness, died for me so that I can live with Him. He goes on, now watch. He justified you, and he, whom He justified, these He also glorified. And people say, oh, I don't want to steal glory from God. Well, that's the thing. You can't steal glory from God if, I get, if He gives it to you. You know, it'd be like me giving you the keys to my car. Well, I don't want to steal your car. I'm giving you the keys to my car. Here's my car, right? Well, I don't want to steal from you. No, I'm giving it to you. Well, I'm there, that's the thing. People say, oh, I don't want to steal glory from God. It's kind of hard to steal glory from God when God's clothed you in His glory. See, the reason you're clothed in His glory is so that the world can see His glory and glorify Him, not glorify you. We should be a reflection of the glory of God. People should look at our lives and see God in us. I mean, I've shared that before. That's the very definition of grace. See, we think of grace as all grace, you know, and we sing songs about it, you know, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, right? We sing those songs. They're old songs, right? But we sing about grace, and we know about grace, but grace is an empowerment to live just like Him. Grace, and I've, I've given you this definition again, so if you, you don't have it, it's in your strongs, it's, it's in there, but watch, I'll give it to you one more time if you want to write it down. Grace is the divine inspiration of God upon the heart with the outward reflection of God in the life. I'll say that one more time. Grace is the divine inspiration of God upon the heart with the outward reflection of God in the life, meaning that they should see God in you. They should no longer see you, but they should see the one that lives in you, which is Christ that lives in me now. Amen?